Happy Saturday, everyone. Now, as I threatened you, I'm going to read you some of my poetry from this book. Now, this is an anthology of stories featuring Iris Wildtime. Wildtime's on the 22, and I was lucky enough to pitch for this and have a story accepted in it. Only mine's not exactly a story, it's a poem in which Iris Wildtime meets Chaucer. Now, the premise of this book is that Iris Wildtime's always been a bit of a name dropper. So in each of these stories, Iris meets a famous person in history. And these include Kate Bush, Fanny and Stella going on the set of Star Wars, Geoffrey Chaucer, of course, and a mysterious biographer known only as Mars. Now, for those of you who don't know, Paul Mars is the creator of Iris Wildtime. Iris Wildtime is a character who depending on the book you read, may or may not be a Time Lord with her own craft, which may or may not be a TARDIS, which is stuck in the shape of the number 22 double-decker bus to Putney Common, which is also slightly smaller on the inside than it is on the outside. My starting point for this is in the Canterbury Tales, which is Chaucer's most famous work, the idea is that while these people, these pilgrims, including Chaucer himself, are on a pilgrimage to Canterbury, each of them will tell a tale from their own lives or from their own experience that has some sort of moral to impart to the reader. But not all the people in the pilgrimage actually get a tale in the finished work. Now, there have been theories as to why this is. These extra tales may have been lost, they may never have been written if Chaucer lost interest. These people may not have told the, any tales. You know, they may have said, oh, my life's not very interesting unless you want to hear about mud. You know, this was the Middle Ages. I decided then to have a look at who hadn't told a story, and I settled on the haberdasher, <laughs> which uh, becomes obvious as you read this, but I won't spoil why it's the haberdasher in particular. But then I decided, why not make Iris's companion Tom into the haberdasher? And so that is what I did, and I'm going to be reading you an extract of this today. So to put you in the picture, this comes after the Parsons tale, so if you want to read the Canterbury Tales up to there and then slot mine in, you can. It is in the form of poems, because Chaucer generally wrote in rhyming couplets, and I've also written it in iambic pentameter, which was an experience, let me tell you. And so as we join the poem, Chaucer has introduced Tom to tell his story, and Tom has told the pilgrims he's going to tell them about a journey he and Iris took to a place called Siri Minima. And that's where we join the story. You, Mrs. Bath, will be snugly at home with the minimums in their froth and their foam, the great Mardi sod named Iris did land on Siri Minima for a drink and, cause she wanted to visit an old flame. Don't get excited, it's always the same. They're mad, or she is, so it's left to me to sort which is which. But this time, you see, we were wrong. Dead wrong. Her old friend had changed. Oh, Iris, he cried, are you really back? Then he was upon her, like Liza on crack. I tried to tell her, but she'd never listen. Not when there's tall, dark blokes to be kissin'. She left the bar fast, vanished in the night. Now the tavern's patrons were a queer sight. Queerer than you lot, and that's saying something. Queerer than me, and that's quite a rum thing. They all turned to face me, as you do now, but slack-jawed, knock-kneed, like a herd of daft cows. They lunged as one force. I fell off me chair. One touched my knee, while another my hair. Iris, I cursed as she left me alone. You can't stop her when that dog's got her bone. I slammed my daiquiri hard on her nose. The dazed heads tilted, their bodies now froze. I crawled backwards fast, the door out of sight, when a male voice spoke, mellow and bright. Hello, dear man, he cooed as he tilted. It looks like your friend has left you all jilted. Come sit with us till she's back, if you please. We have wine to spare, some grapes and ripe cheese. I looked round the room, and my stomach churned. No one else faced me, and no one's eyes burned deep into my head. Had I dreamed it? Looking to the voice, his smile was slit, with eyes enticing. So taking his hand, I was led to a table near the band. His name was Jeff Flick, a small snub nose, a green fedora. My interest rose. And the wine did flow, with cheese aplenty. 
I knew in the morn. I'd need a venti. Jeff Lick kept my glass topped up, and what's more, invinced me to table <laughs> and to the floor. The minute slipped by, Iris quite forgot. To be blunt, dear pilgrims, Jeff Lick was hot. So when I noticed his hand on my knee, did I object? No chance, I let it be. The band played softer, my head found its rest. Jeff Lick's own developed pillowy chest. I spare no blushes of my tradesmen's friends. The wife of Bath is aware of my ends. She is not alone, so pick up your jaws. Pilgrims, I kissed him and tightened my claws. If Iris was to leave me abandoned, I would leave with my horizons expanded. Now, it gets a bit raunchier from there, but there's also a bit of a threat later on, as you might have guessed. Now, you can buy this book from Obverse Books. The details are listed and linked in the description. It's a really great book, and if I have to pick out one of the other stories that really touched me and I really enjoyed, it's the Kate Bush one. I do recommend you read that as well. But, yeah, there's Prince George, there's Andy Warhol... Do yourself a favour and get this book. It's not all laughs, there's real heart, there's real jeopardy and real danger. If you're a Doctor Who fan and you've never heard of Iris Wildtime, this is a great book to start on. Listed and linked downstairs, and I will see you tomorrow for a Rapid Randomizer review. Thank you very much for watching.